Yeah, I think so. you should start too. Yeah, so, yeah. so thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, so, I'm Andy Jefferson. Um, and the talk today is titled Survival Outcomes, the Effects of an Educational Video Game on Students' Understanding and Motivation. Um, so what we're going to talk about is going from the idea of this game to actually producing it and getting it in front of students in the classroom and the effects we found once we had it there. Um, and I actually want to start over. Um, for that point about why I actually did this project. So, so the background to this is that there's a strong literature and a lot of theories about how to design educationally effective video games, but there's much less work actually empirically testing those designs and seeing what sort of benefits they have in the classroom. Um, so digging into those theories of design, um, as I said, there's a lot of work that's been done on it, and looking uh, at, the, at that work across disciplines, there's actually some common themes that sort of emerge on how they suggest building educationally effective games. Um, one of the main things is that the content of interest should be integrated into the mechanics of the game, should actually build what you want students to get out of it into the rules of how the game works. Um, and beyond that, it just sort of hits these general principles of how to make a good game, that the game should be challenging, it should provide meaningful choices. And so what I want to do is talk about what these mean, and for those later two about, um, while there's not a lot of empirical work on how effective educational games based on these principles are, um, how these are based on established theories, and they actually provide a pretty strong argument that we would expect to be effective. So talking about what integrating educational content means, I think this is best illustrated by a contrasting example. So let's say that you have a game where you're navigating a maze. And when, you reach, when you're navigating a maze and you reach a door, you have to answer, let's say, a math problem about angles in order to open that door and continue navigating the maze. So this is an example of content that's not well integrated into the mechanics of the game that's really sort of separate from the core experience. So in this case, it's often called divorce content, where solving the math problem is not actually involved in the experience of navigating this maze. And actually, it's serving as an obstacle to that experience um, that is probably what the player finds enjoyable and why they're playing it to begin with. Um, so it actually interferes, and you can actually communicate that the educational content is not fun and something you have to work through in order to be rewarded with the fun part of the game. On the other hand, let's say that you want to teach that same content uh, involving math problems about angles. So maybe you do an artillery game where you're solving these problems with angles in order to hit a target that you're trying to hit. Um, in this case, some of those problems is, is well integrated into the core experience of the game. It's hard to separate from it, and it's hard to replace. In the maze example, you could replace the math problems with like geography questions or whatever you want because it's so uh, separate. Whereas in this case, it would be hard to replace that educational content. Um, it also sort of demonstrates how using this skill can be applied to solve a problem. It makes it sort of meaningful instead of being an obstacle to what you enjoy. Um, and this is what you, the theme you see in a lot of this uh, literature I was talking about, where the game should be placing the educational content at the heart of gameplay so the children engage in targeted real world behavior thinking as they play the game. So um, it does care require carefully thinking about what sort of mechanics fit the content you're trying to convey. Um, so it requires a little more effort in doing these sort of divorce uh, designs. But it means that if the students are engaging with that game, they're also at some level engaging with the content because they're so closely linked. And this leads us to sort of these other principles, it's just sort of good general design. So if you have that integration so that if the, student, if the players are engaging with the game, they're also engaging with the content, then you want to make a game that engages the players, right? So in this case, you have things like the game should be challenging, the appropriate level of challenging, the game should provide meaningful choices. And what I want to uh, dig into for a minute here is how these sorts of principles actually um, have a strong basis in the in well-established motivational literature. Um, so 
one of the major theories of motivation is self-determination theory, um, which talks about how um, the perceived source of uh, rewards and punishments affects your motivation to perform a task. So how like extrinsic motivations from outside you, such as punishments, rewards, getting paid to do something, uh, can affect your behavior, as well as how intrinsic motivations, like actually finding something interesting or enjoyable, these sources of motivation that come from within a person can affect their behavior. Um, so since we're talking about education, let's use an example in the classroom of how these might be different. So grades and penalties can be seen as extrinsic motivators. You know, they're being handed down from the teacher and imposed on the student. They can be seen this way, and they can actually communicate that you're doing this to please someone else, not because you yourself find it an enjoyable experience or rewarding. Um, and this can make students less likely to perform these things on their own. Uh, so this is the idea, right, if I used to enjoy doing this, but now I got paid to do it and it feels like work, so I don't enjoy doing it as much anymore. It's the theory that sort of speaks to those sorts of phenomena. Um, on the other hand, it also addresses how you can create intrinsic motivation by appealing to things that are already intrinsically motivating, something someone already finds interesting. So in the classroom, this would be like the teacher who individualizes the lesson. So they say, all right, this student really likes space. I want to teach the math. Here's how you can use math to solve rocketry problems and show how here's something you're already interested in. Here's how it applies to something that now I can help you become interested in this and see how it's useful. However, if you want to be building intrinsic motivation for something in a general audience rather than specifically, then you have to find something that a general audience is intrinsically interested in. This requires you to find something that's broadly appealing. So this is where you get uh, really big stuff like everyone wants to feel like they are competent, or everyone wants to feel like they're in control of their life, like they have a sense of autonomy. Um, and this goes to a more recent theory of motivation. It's called the player experience of need satisfaction. So this is actually work that builds on self-determination theory, and specifically applies it to the design of video games, and looks at both how they create intrinsic motivation, and how to specifically um, design mechanics to make them more intrinsically motivating. Um, so it's both sort of a descriptive and a prescriptive theory. Um, and within uh, PENS, it um, sort of focuses on these three areas, the needs for a sense of competence, of autonomy, and of relatedness. And I'm not going to really get into relatedness today because that's a whole can of worms. But in terms of the specific mechanics that can satisfy these needs and help create intrinsic motivation in players, uh, for example, providing the right level of challenge can help create a sense of competence in the player, a sense of accomplishment. And this builds on ideas like Vygotsky's own proximal development or Cheeks and Mihai's concept of flow. Um, that if you have something that's too hard, it's going to frustrate the player, but if you have something that's too easy, it's going to bore them. Whereas if you have something that requires some level of effort but is doable, they'll create this sense of accomplishment, this sense of competence. Um, also, this becomes important in designing systems of feedback to tell the player that they have achieved their goal. So again, fostering that sense of accomplishment. And also, when they fail to meet that goal, to provide scaffolding to help them learn how to do it better next time so they can eventually succeed, which can also create an even greater sense of accomplishment. And some games that do this, like um, this game Dance Dance Revolution, where you're trying to time the button presses correctly, and they're coming very rapidly, and every single one gives you feedback on how you're doing. Um, on the other side, um, providing meaningful choices can create a sense of autonomy, so a sense that you have control over what's going on. And what I mean by meaningful choices here are informed choices that have consequences. So on the one hand, the choices you're making actually impact the future of the game. And on the other hand, you actually have enough information that you have some idea of what the consequences of those choices are going to be. Um, and this could be at any level of gameplay. So for example, when you're playing Mario, when you jump is a meaningful choice. You're going to be making it a lot. Um, but when you're jumping in relation to that pit is literally a life or death decision that's going to affect the future of your game. On the other hand, you have more recent games like Mass Effect, um, where you're playing sort of a Captain Kirk-style starship captain, and you're getting to choose between uh, various characters and races asking for help. And which ones you choose to help and which ones you don't is going to impact which ones are available 
later on in the game to help you out and what sort of help they'll be able to provide. Um, and you actually have information about probably what kinds of help they'll be able to abide, provide. So players who are playing this game may end up with two star systems that look very different, but that'll be based on their choices. And they'll have had um, information so that they have a sense of control over what sort of end state they want to be going for, leaving out Mass Effect 3. <laughs> um, so it's a sense of control over what happened. So that leads us back to sort of these general principles are sort of based on these motivational theories. So the game should be at the appropriate level of challenging as this can support a sense of competence and it should provide meaningful choices that supports a sense of auto autonomy. So really these are saying that you want to design educational games that fulfill player needs and create intrinsic motivation to continue playing or more simply, you want to make good games that people want to play. Okay, so there's the theory and why I think it makes some strong arguments even though there is not very much empirical support uh, in terms of educational effectiveness. Um, now turning to what that empirical support looks like and why it's maybe not there. Um, so a few recent reviews have uh, said that the findings on education and effectiveness are inconclusive. This is an um, earlier study by the Navy and a more recent study by the National Research Council. And they have a few things to say about uh, why this is. The first is just that there's not much empirical work on the subject. Um, and what does exist tends to be fragmented between different disciplines that use different terminologies, different methodologies, and make it hard to compare. Um, the National Research Council review actually cited some more specific problems that those who do do, do research on this area, um, a lot of them fail to define the specific learning goals that the game is trying to address. Um, they fail to describe how the game is intended to meet those learning goals, and then they fail to use measures that address those goals that they failed to define. Um, a lot of them also are failing to provide control groups and look at the game as part of a larger curriculum, so it's hard to separate the actual impact of the game from the effects of those other activities, um, which is a major problem. Um, another thing is that a lot of educational games are not to design based on these principles that I just described. Um, these, you have games like the early edutainment boom, there's been a lot of criticism of the games that came out during that period. A lot of the principles I was talking about are actually responses to the flaws of those early games. Um, things like they have divorced mechanics, um, they focused more on extrinsic motivation like points and levels, um, they had little interactivity or agency, so a lot of them were referred to as splash card approaches. Um, this is an example called financial football that I found online. Um, and for example, you're answering questions about financial planning, multiple choice questions, in order to move a football down the field. Um, so... <laughs> well, the, the entire boom was like this. <laughs> Yeah. People so, made a lot of money off this. I know. Well, I don't think it could it could work if the choices were receivers at various points and the uh, position of the defense. Was, was, it, was it designed to be for people who like football? Mm -hmm. was that the Presumably. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you just wanted to make a financial quiz, you could make a financial quiz. So they're specifically people adding the football, football content. And then had to manage their money. Okay. This is no different than Math Blaster and yeah. everything in that genre. <laughs> and as I said, like little interactivity, low production quality in terms of graphics, sound, <laughs> and as, as you might, might guess, these were found to be educationally ineffective and were not voluntarily played outside of school. <laughs> But this, this, I found this floating around online last year. Like these sort of games are still being made because they're really easy. Oh wait, this is a recent game. Financial football. Oh my god. <laughs> can you send me a link for that? <laughs> I can, I can try and find we it. We have a friend, friend that one of our best friends who played for the Cleveland Browns oh. for ten years, and he's a professor of engineering now. Matt Miller, you know that. Oh, should they get a kid on so, yes. And he he'll just die if I bring that with me to <laughs> meal at the dining hall and send it to him or whatever. Well, he'll die. I, if you just go online and like Google like educational games, you'll see lots financial of financial football. He's also going to a bad divorce, messy financial divorce. So he can presumably <laughs> actually <laughs> utilize this. Okay. Maybe. Thanks a lot. Andy. But yeah, still being made really use today, yeah. even though we don't like, they're laughably <laughs> ineffective. <laughs> and so these sort of games are still floating around, and they might get picked up in those reviews of it, the effectiveness of educational games, which is going to provide some some noise and problems. If we want to talk about how effective uh, games based on those principles are going to be, since they're not. Um, 
Now, on the other hand, there are some more well-designed games going around, like Quest of Atlantis, Outbreak of the Institute, Mad City Mystery. Now, there are some. Well, so, like, these last two are augmented reality games where you're using your smartphone, taking actions in the real world that have impacts on the game world, like going around your school to solve a mystery. Um, and these are great for the immersion and, uh, immersion and engagement of the students. However, since they're location-based, it can be difficult for teachers to adapt them to their specific school, difficult to pick up and use. Um, one example of a game that I really like is this game called Supercharge, I think provides an interesting example. Um, so this was a game trying to make the principles of electromagnetics as gameplay. So as an example of integrated design, the way this works is you're trying to navigate a maze with your spaceship. And the way you do that, you have limited uh, fuel for direct thrust, but you can change the charge of the ship, which changes whether it's attracted to or repelled by charged objects in the environment. And in fact, the uh, way the levels are set up is there's a planning phase where you can place a limited number of charged particles, and then there's the uh, actually navigating phase where you're piloting the ship through it, making use of those things you place. Um, this idea here was that students would actually get intuitive knowledge about how these fields interact and traction and repulsion work. Um, and they tested it in three urban middle school science classrooms. Um, and found that students who got the game versus students who received normal instruction uh, had higher performance on pre-test or uh, pre-post measures such as grasping the role of distance because it's one thing to be reading about how it's an exponential function it's another feel how much stronger it attracts or repels you based on how far away your ship is um, they're equally able to describe the, uh, the fields but the students in the game condition tend to reference in-game challenges whereas students in the normal condition um, tend to seem like they were reciting stuff that they had memorized. And also one of the interesting things that was noted in this study was how initially the teachers and students were unsure how to use the game in the classroom. So the researchers had to develop handouts sort of in the midst of the study in order to scaffold uh, teachers using this, uh, using this effectively and the students getting the most out of it. Um, so moving from the findings that are currently available to the current work, um, the goal of this project was to try and test the effects of a game that deeply integrates the educational content into the mechanics uh, and, and test those effects in actual classrooms. And specifically, I want to look at the effects on content knowledge, on interest and motivation, so sort of interest in science and, and the topic, and look at the ability of students who played the game to sort of reason about these concepts and apply them to problems. Um, and the content of interest here is evolutionary biology. So with wanting to pursue those goals, this required both, uh, this required three things, developing a game itself, developing a module around the game to support, play, uh, to support the players using it to learn and the teachers using it in classrooms, and developing an assessment to address those particular questions. So, get into exactly how this game works, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with. Um, I've never heard of this word cell evil before. Maybe. Yeah. It's never even, it's, it's actually never sex is cell vival. Cell vival, yes. Okay? Yes. That's never, the name of the game, never. literally. <laughs> never even read that word. Because it's always the game, right? Cell <laughs> Yes, cell vival. It was, that was the work in progress title, but no one came up with a better one, so we just stuck with it. Um, so, at a basic level, what it looks like is you play as the cell trying to navigate the event. So, you control a tetrahymena cell trying to eat these smaller bacteria that are food and not get eaten by the larger guys, which may be about to happen there. <laughs> um, so, in the game, as in life, the goal is to survive as long as it's possible. Like different assets. Uh, we it did fix the, we fixed the resolution issue before we got into actual testing, but this ah. was before that. So yeah, it's a little bit. Also, the video capture was a little bit low quality. I see. So there was some issues of capture and some issues of the assets. Um, but yeah, so you're trying to survive as long as possible, um, and even at this basic level, of just roaming around the environment, the kids can get a lot out of it. So all of the so the predators are based on actual predators, and so you're going to learn like what are the predators of tetrahymena. What does it eat? What are the feeding behaviors of the predators? Because if you're trying not to get eaten, that becomes very relevant. Um, and also, like, how different substances affect the cell. So that black patch right there is actually a toxin that will affect your, swim your swimming. 
So if you're trying to avoid a predator or chase down food, that's also going to become very um, important to you. Um, and basically just to sort of get kids to see life of a single cell in a pond as interesting and exciting and worth looking into. Um, but I said that we were trying to look at evolutionary biology, so how does the game address that? So we sort of represent variation and change over time in a very concrete way here. So the cell you're playing as has four different traits, um, move speed, maneuverability or turn speed, uh, hazard resistance, and digestion, or how much uh, energy you get from the food that you eat. Um, and these are actually laid out in opposing pairs. So like, if you become faster, you're also becoming less maneuverable. So let's say that you reproduce and you change the traits of your cell a little bit and you become faster. We can represent that as moving towards the speed side and away from maneuverability. So we can lay out an axis like that. We can do that with both to create a two-dimensional space where a point defines the traits of your cell. So then we can show the change between generations as a line. So you can say, all right, you started off balanced, your next generation became a little bit faster, the generation after that became more hazardous and those about as fast, and so on and so forth. So we can visually represent how it changes over time and feed this back to the player in a very concrete way. Because otherwise, how changes accumulate can be kind of an abstract concept. And what we actually do is we use this in the reproduction interface to sort of, I was saying, one of the principles is you want to provide meaningful choices and you want to make sure that they have the information to make those choices. So in this case, the graph on the left here, your left, yes, um, is showing the history of the cell you're playing as, what the previous generations were. And so you can think about how those traits influenced how hard it was to survive when you're making your next reproductive choice. In this case, you have your choice of asexual or sexual reproduction. And if you sexually reproduce, we also have this history graph for potential mates. You can see what their previous generations were like, and more importantly, what their current traits are, which will influence your offspring if you decide to mate with them. So you can think about, well, I was fast, but I became a little more hazardous and a little less fast. Um, was that a good move? Did that help me this time? Or would it, was, would it be better if I picked a mate who was faster to get more speed again? And sort of base your decisions on this previous information that you have, sort of reflect on it. Um, so within this, what's happening is you play as the cell trying to get enough food to reproduce and survive predators. When you get enough food, you can reproduce and you can change your traits by a little bit. And then we kick you back into the cell of the next generation, seeing how that change in traits affected your survival rate. And we allow the players to iterate on this and feel how changes accumulate, how different traits make it easier or harder, diff or harder to survive in that particular environment and sort of explore that possibility space. Um, and also, we have another layer we have different environments that they can pick from. Um, and these aren't meant to provide a difficulty progression. They're supposed to advantage different traits. So remember I was saying there's sort of that trade-off. So if you're faster, you're less maneuverable and vice versa. So we set up the environment. So like this one has um, predators that will chase you, maybe less obstacles. So there's more room to run away from people. Whereas we have another one with more stable predators. This orange thing is sort of like a sea anemone. It's just going to sit there and hope you collide into it so it can pull you in. Um, and lots of hazards, so it's hard to have a straight line to actually build up speed. Um, so it might be that speed is more advantaged in this environment and maneuverability is more advantaged in this environment. So actually, being fast and active means you have less maneuverability is going to be disadvantaged. So we can make points to the players about how it's not just that one trait is good or bad, it's how it, fitness is contextual. This trait is good in this environment and disadvantageous in this other environment. So across that, we sort of have these layers of what's going on in terms of uh, evolutionary concepts. And there's a couple other systems in the way it differentiates between asexual and sexual reproduction. So for example, with sexual reproduction, when you're choosing a mate, you can change your traits by more. Whereas when you asexually reproduce, your traits don't change as much, and they change sort of randomly, but they increase your population. And the way the population works is, when, if you do die, you get kicked to another member of the population. If you're the last member and you get eaten, then you restart the level. So this advantage is having a large population. So I know that a lot, I'm just going to ask, because I, I remember the early days of this, a lot of this, particularly with the sexual and asexual reproduction, mm -hmm. was basically influenced because the vet school group that was doing Tetra Time and us had an agenda for that, right? Yeah. Though I also noticed that 
um, like they wanted a lot more axes, and and you sort of settled on on two, right? Yeah, because we wanted to keep it understandable and intelligible to the students. Okay, I mean that's that's one of the things that sort of wanting to know is like you know when this became more of sort of like originally this was like something that the Tetrahymena group wanted to do, mm -hmm. and when then this actually turned into an educational study, what changes did that cause on your design? Um. I mean, we intended to study it from the start, so I don't think the actual study caused a lot of changes. I think, as, as with any project, there were a lot of features that were planned that didn't make it into the final build. Mm -hmm. So one of the ideas with having multiple axes, so we, set, we always wanted to start with two axes, and I think the thinking was if we wanted to do three dimensions, we would eventually add those on. So they could get the hang of how it worked moving around in two dimensions, and then add a third one once that was, was established, and then we just never mm -hmm. added it in. Um, I think. That is just okay. Um, and there's also a in-game reference. So anytime you mouse over anything, predators, mm -hmm. obstacles, substances, it's going to have the name of what that is, it's sort of an obtrusive at the top. And if you click on, if the student clicks on it, they can get more information. They're taken to an entry that provides in more information about how it works in the game and how it works out of the game. So we want to sort of scaffold that information seeking and reward it. So. That's the design of the game and how it works. Um, I also could speak quickly about the production and all the things that went into it, but I'll leave that for the thanks at the end um, and the timeline it took. Um, so the other thing we had to develop the game module. So there's actually some work that shows how teachers are not very familiar with video games. High school teachers tend not to be, and you can talk to them if you want confirmation of this. And also, they're specifically not used to using video games as a learning tool in a classroom environment. So one of the things that we wanted to do was make it as easy as possible for teachers to use this. So we developed a game module to go around the game. This included a full two-day lesson plan and student handouts they could use, detailed description of how the game works, because students aren't going to read a game manual, but the teachers want to know exactly how it works for them to be comfortable with it. Um, and discussion guides for each day. So the lesson plan actually sort of involved these cycles of playing the game, then discussing that experience with the rest of the class so that players can compare their experiences, the teacher can highlight important lessons, and then we play the ga game again, sort of building their understanding. Because uh, as just discussed, there's sort of a lot of things going on. So it helps to sort of discuss it and then build, and then play it again, looking at new things. And we had discussion guides for exactly like what sort of questions you might want to ask after the different sessions of play, what sort of responses you might get, how to respond to them. Like I said, try and make it as easy as possible for the teachers to use. Um, and then in terms of the assessment, in order to sort of get these questions of, you know, how are they going to perform on tests about this content? Do they know the important concepts, multiple choice questions? On how interested are they in it? How does their interest change? What are interest scales? <coughs> And can they reason about the topic? We went with short answer questions. It's also addressed some of the gaps that may have been left by the multiple choice. I'll talk about specifically those items in the results. Okay, so here's the materials we developed. Now, in terms of the methods we're using for the study, um, we'll start talking about the research design because there's sort of an interesting uh, progression in itself, as you are well aware. <laughs> um, this is Erica from the Statistical Consulting Unit, who is very helpful. <laughs> um, so initially, we want to look at how um, the game leads to gains and compare it against typical instruction. So we start off with a standard pre-post design. Um, the issue with this is that you're going to have a no-game group, and it is really hard to recruit teachers that are not going to then get to use this cool educational video game that they're working <laughs> on and they're really excited about. Um, it also led to this question of if you have two of these groups at the same school, if the students are going to become resentful that they're not in the group and their friends are going to tell them about it and all of these sorts of concerns. So to address that, we looked at this idea of a switching replications design. So now you have, everyone gets the game module, but you can still make these comparisons between those who got the game module and typical instruction. Every class is giving you data on both sets. And you can look at order effects, which are going to become very relevant in that. Um, the issue with this design is now we have three time points using the same assessment, so practice effects become a concern. Um, however, there is yet another design called the Solomon Four Group design that allows you to look for treatment effects and practice effects. So the 
final design was a combination of a switching replication design and Solomon four group designs. Um, so this allows us to check for both practice effects and order effects, which are going to become important in a minute. And it means that every class provides information about the game module and typical instruction. Now this may look complicated, but ultimately it's a two by two design where the groups are the, whether you received a pretest or no pretest, and whether you received the game first or second. And note that when I'm talking about pretest, I'm only talking about whether you received a test at time one or not. Or when you received time two and time three. So this is the design we used, and then moving on to the participants, we recruited high school biology teachers through an online forum, which the asset program helped us get in touch with. Um, a total of five teachers across New York State agreed to participate, each at different schools, um, during the fall term of 2014. They told, taught a total of 10 different classes with a total of 169 students, um, mostly 11th and 12th graders. There was one class of 8th graders. Um, they were primarily white. It was split between two of the teachers, and four of the classes then were AP, and the rest were non-AP, including the one eighth grade class, and they were about evenly split between male and female students. Now, turning from the participants to the results, and specifically let's talk about compliance issues. So I said there were 169 students that participated, and of that, a total of nine, only 90 students had um, all the assessment, completed all the assessments that uh, they were supposed to for their condition. So, so for example, in class two, they're supposed to be a pretest class, so they're supposed to complete assessments at times one, two, and three. We see 18 of the students did that, or we see three of the students only completed the assessments at time two and three. Maybe they weren't there at day one. Um, two of the students only completed days one and two. Maybe they weren't there at day three. We see these sort of scattershot compliance issues throughout all the classes. However, some of the classes have a different uh, problem. So for class one, this was also a pretest class. They were supposed to complete assessments at times one, two, and three. And we see only one of the students did that, whereas 18 of the students only completed uh, assessments at time one and two. So here, it looks like there may have been a more systematic issue. Maybe there's an issue with miscommunication with the teacher about what assessments the class was supposed to do, or with the way the teacher administered those assessments. And we actually see these sorts of issues where the majority of the class uh, was not usable in three of the classes, that, of the ten classes that were used. So some of the students from each class were either missing days or made other mistakes, which reduced the amount of usable data. Um, and three of the classes had the majority of students not compliant, which may have been a miscommunication either with the teacher about what was supposed to happen or by the teacher about what the students were supposed to do. Um, and this actually reduced the amount of usable data such that um, there was not enough uh, data to separate the students by AP or non-AP, so all of the students were pooled for the subsequent analyses. Um, turning to the results on multiple choice items, which are more straightforward. Um, first, total multiple choice scores were calculated for how many items each student got correct. Uh, there were no significant differences at time two. At time three, we saw this effect where there were, um, we saw significant effects of order and number of tests, so whether they were pre-tests or not did have an effect, but it didn't interact with game order, it was just an additive effect. Um, we see those who got the game second and had no pre-tests uh, had higher total scores. However, we're really interested in what the difference in the games were, how, those, uh, how students improved when they got the game module versus how they improved during typical instruction. So game scores were also calculated, um, and we find that the only significant effect from time one to two, again, was the initial score at time one, um, such that those who initially scored higher tended to have lower gains, so there may have been some regression to the mean or ceiling effects going on. However, from time two to three, we see that there were significant differences in um, gain scores, such that, again, um, those who got the game second had higher gains than those who got the game first, and again, those who had no pretested better than those students who were pretested. Um, and again, there was a, also some effect of the initial score at time, this time referring to the score at time two. Um, now, it also looked at the game scores across intervals, so for example, comparing those who received the game module second to the game scores of those who received the game module first while they were receiving the game module. Um, and we found a three-way interaction of which interval it was, um, what their initial score was, so whether that was the score at time one or at time two, depending on interval. Um, and whether they received the game first or second. Um, so looking at the game second group, here in interval one, when they're receiving typical instruction, we see again this pattern where those who 
um, initially scored high at time one had lower gains than those who initially scored low. And this pattern is actually fairly consistent in interval two. However, when we look at the game first group, uh, during interval one when they're receiving the game module, we see this more exaggerated pattern where those who initially scored high had even lower gains and those who initially scored low had even greater gains. So perhaps they were getting more out of it or there um, was more of a regression effect. However, when we move to interval two, when they're now receiving typical instruction, we still see these lower gains for those who initially scored high, this time at time two. However, we see much uh, lower gains for those who initially scored low, much more similar to the game's second group. So these lower gains, um, these, this reduction in gains may have been focused in that group. Now, we also did a follow-up questionnaire to the teachers, with the teachers where we ask them about the demographic information for the students as well as a general rating of the students' motivation in class. Um, there were no significant effects of sex or race. However, there were significant group differences in the average rate, teacher ratings of student motivation uh, between groups. So this is a confounding factor because we see that for the game second no pretest group, which we saw having the highest game scores, they actually also had the highest motivation scores. Um, and this is problematic as motivation also was found to have a significant effect on the multiple choice scores. Um, at time two, um, having higher motivation resulted in having higher total scores. And at time three, uh, it actually interacted with the presentation order such that students who had higher motivation tend to get more out of having the game second. Um, while this is uh, compound and problematic, I um, think that we can still say that having the game second had an effect because if you look, the no pretest group had significantly higher motivation, but if we look at the pretest groups, we see approximately the same motivation, and we can see that for the pretest group, um, even their game second still has significantly higher gains. So I think that while the, motiv the confounding motivation may have exaggerated the effect, I think we can still uh, say that having the game second had an effect on the pretest, uh, on the multiple choice uh, gains. Okay, so there's the multiple choice items. Um, moving to the motivation scales. Um, at time two, there was again very little difference. We saw a um, effect where the game first group uh, had a low had a lower interest in discussing biology in class, so maybe they didn't really enjoy that part of the module. Um, however, at time three, we saw some complicated effects in two scales that were closely related to the content of the game module. In this case, doing interactive science activities and the topic of natural selection. Um, we didn't see really any significant effects on any of the other scales, so it didn't generalize very much. Um, and they both had a very similar pattern, where for the no pretest, so for the game first group, uh, this is, again, just looking at interval two. Um, for the game first group, uh, they had about the same sort of pattern we've been seeing in the head across the pretest or no pretest. Whereas the game second group, we see they had actually those that initially scored their interest as very low, saw much higher gains than the game first group after they um, received the game model. So it seems like they really had their interest sparked by this, whereas um, we still see somewhat lower gains on the high end. Um, and for the pretest group, we see this is actually more flattened pattern, um, which, again, I can only think it must have been something like testing fatigue. They just weren't as interested after having filled this test multiple times. And we see that pattern sort of across both of these. So moving to the short answer items, um, just as a briefly go over what those were. Um, we sort of had a question, two questions looking at sort of, can you define and address sort of central concepts to the content we're looking at? So can you define what makes one organism more fit than another in terms of natural selection? And also sort of, for organisms that sexually reproduce, how do they mate, or how do they select a mate? So sort of getting at these important concepts or the mechanisms behind them, whereas question seven, was more of a question about a selective pressure and asking them to reason about the effects of it. In this case, we're introducing a predator into an environment with a bunch of prey. How do you expect that population of prey to change? So the way we dealt with these was uh, the responses were coded for length in terms of number of words, 
Um, a, they were scored for a general depth rating, and they were also assessed on the presence of binary markers, uh, which were determined by looking at the responses. So as an example of what the, some of those look like, so for question six, for what makes an organism more fit, like do they mention survival rate at all? Do they mention reproduction at all? Do they mention um, passing on their traits to the next generation? Do they mention reproducing more than others? Do they mention these things at all in their responses? Um, and then the depth rating was used was generated by looking at sort of not just if they mentioned them, but also how they use them, if they actually seemed to understand what was going on and could form a coherent explanation. Um, just as an example of some of the responses this was used to score, um, it was, there was wide variability in student responses. So you get things from like, an organism's more fit if it can survive and reproduce more than some individuals to something, you know, nice and punchy like habitat. <laughs> or the feature of the organism has. Like there was a wide range of the understanding that was exhibited here. Um, so looking at um, these ratings of length and depth, there were no pretest effects uh, for six or seven. Um, there were many significant effects on eight at all. Um, during in interval one, the only difference was less gain of depth in question six for the gain first group. Um, whereas for interval two, the only difference was there was a greater gain depth on question seven for the gain second group. So the gain first group, when they got the gain module, their um, responses on why is it a or is it more fit, it showed less gain depth compared to those who were receiving typical instruction. Whereas for question seven, um, when they were receiving it second, they had uh, their responses got deeper in terms of discussing how selective pressure might work um, compared to those who were receiving typical instruction at that time. Um, so it may be that typical instruction leads to better definitions of terms, whereas gain second led to a better understanding of the process of how this might work. Um, and I also have data on the individual markers, but I wasn't sure there was going to be time to go into those, or they were very informative. So there is also sort of to summarize, there were significant compliance issues. Um, we saw greater gains for gains second in terms of the multiple choice items. Um, there were very specific gains in terms of the motivation scales where it seemed to only affect the scales that were closely related to the game module and it mostly saw gains for those who initially had low motivation scores. Um, and the short answer items showed kind of mixed results in how uh, helpful the game module was. Or, at least, or may have also been very specific in sort of what um, problems the game helps students get an understanding of. Um, you know, let's talk about some of the significant limitations of this study, both uh, specifically in terms of the sample that was used, the fidelity, and, the, and then some just general issues of the design. So teachers were self-selected. That's a basic limitation. Also, there were those compliant differences in motivation rating, which, as I said, um, I don't think um, sufficiently explain the game's second effect that we can say that there isn't an effect, but they are problematic for looking at it. Um, and also, just because of the size of the sample, couldn't differentiate between uh, AP and non-AP students, and there was a mix of eighth and 12th grade. So there's just a lot of variability and noise in this particular sample. Um, though I will point out that, so for the um, no pretest game second group that was doing so well, um, they had higher motivation, but you'll notice that there was actually primarily non-AP students, whereas the pretest game first group that was doing, um, whereas some of the uh, game first groups also were primarily AP students. So it's not just that the AP students are doing better or having more gains than the non-AP students. That's actually something else going on. Um, but yeah, there were issues with the sample. Um, there were also issues with how the teachers administered the assessments and the module themselves. So since this was distributed online, there was very little direct instruction to the teachers and there was no direct observation. I don't actually know what was going on in those classrooms. Um, and I think this may have been a factor in the compliance issues we saw. Um, and more specifically, both from the pilot data where I, the pilot where I was in local classrooms observing how they used the module and from some of the informal comments and emails from teachers, um, the teachers may have been using the module very differently. And that, like, some of them would really focus on the handouts and make sure the students were filling them out. And 
really sort of downplay the discussion, whereas others were really focused on the discussion, didn't really use the handout as outs at all. So there may have been a wide variability in the fidelity to the intervention. And, um, and this seems very common sort of when teachers get a resource from online or adapting it to use in their specific classroom. Um, so in that case, it sort of provides some ecological validity, but it's problematic for the research. Um, and just general in terms of the uh, design. So I was designing both what learning games, uh, the game and the module and the multiple choice items, whereas they were designed typical instruction to be whatever they were doing. So it may have been multiple choice items fit what we were trying to do better than the typical instruction. That could cause some issues of comparison there. Um, also, motivation with self-report measures. So again, that's just a stand, rather standard limitation. Um, in terms of research design, there's no follow-up, so we don't know how persistent these effects are. Um, also, um, as I said, everyone received the game module, so there was no, no game condition across both intervals for us to compare the final outcomes to. Um, and in terms of the game design, so this is a fairly complex game, so it would be hard to compare the results for this to say something like financial football, which is very different. Um, however, I think that's actually also sort of one of the benefits is that um, we can look at the results from this and perhaps provide some guidance to other people looking to develop these kinds of com more complex educational games with really closely integrated content. And I think this order effect is really significant for them uh, in terms of talking about how it looks like if you want to use this kind of game in a classroom, it's important to provide that foundation of terms and knowledge for them to get the most benefit out of that game. So how much of this do you think is sort of like relative to sort of like the level design, right? I mean, because like when you look at games right now, one of the things in game design is sort of tutorial design on how to sort of get the player to learn how to do the, the games, yeah. right? And so could it be a case, right, that maybe that the tutorial how to play the game wasn't scaffolded enough and the reason yeah. why you're seeing the order effects mm -hmm. is because in essence the teachers are sort of indirectly using the traditional instruction yeah. as a way to and this is what you should get out of the game right as opposed to go at it yeah well and that's interesting because one of the things that we really tried to um deal with in the module was making sure to sort of scaffold what you're supposed to be getting out of it and both for the teachers and for the players but with this order effect, apparently it wasn't sufficient, mm -hmm. that you also need that typical instruction to really get enough knowledge to benefit from it. Um, yeah, but I think that's an important lesson for other people who are trying to make these kinds of games, to know that going in, that you really need to hammer on, making sure that they know what's going on before they get into the game in order to get the most out of it. And also some of the um, <coughs> decreases or uh, lower gains that we saw in the game first group de demonstrate the hazard of time to use it if you don't have that. That um, maybe if you just drop it in, it makes the typical instruction seem less interesting following it up, but you don't have that foundation to really get the most out of the game. So it can sort of be uh, a very suboptimal approach or lead to damaging, damaging outcomes. Also, um, there were limited motivational effects, but there were motivational effects, so it speaks to how you may be able to address some engagement problems in classrooms. Um, and also, just as a very specific point, since there's this emphasis on standardized testing in classrooms, the fact that we saw um, changes on the multiple choice items, which are also specifically developed looking at things like the next generation science standards. Um, it speaks to the fact that uh, games can be a useful tool for addressing those sorts of tests and outcome measures. Um, in terms of further work, like the most basic thing is there simply just needs to be more work done with these sorts of games in this sort of environment. Um, though it's very difficult to do this kind of work, um, especially if you want high quality games and assessments because you need to have a whole bunch of different people coming together on the same page in order to do this effectively in terms of educators, administrators, game design, programmers, artists, content experts, uh, and researchers. Every, all those different kinds of expertises on the same page. Um, in terms of future work also needs to you know, look across populations and subjects, how these effects might differ in different groups. As I said, we couldn't really uh, differentiate with this sample between the effects on AP versus not, or across grade levels, there might be different effects on those groups. But even beyond that, things like different socioeconomic statuses, past academic performance, if students think that they're 
aren't good at science, but they like video games, it might be effective there. Uh, it might be interesting how different cultural backgrounds work. Um, you can get into that uh, idea of the individualist versus collectivist things and social games versus competitive. Um, uh, and even across teachers, if they have different instructional styles, different classroom structures, different school cultures, how that might affect um, what effects games have and which sorts of games are going to have be effective. Um, also, we would since these are based on sort of these basic learning um, theories, we would expect it to have effects across different subjects. So I talked about a physics game, this was a biology game, but you would expect these principles to hold in things like history or economics or even other areas of biology, but that work simply needs to be done. Um, and beyond this sort of course idea of if these games are effective, there's then the more nuanced what specific mechanics have what effects for different groups uh, to really dig into those sort of questions. How different rules uh, might have different effects for different groups or in different subjects. So sort of the take home conclusions that I think we can draw from all of this is that these kinds of complex library games really need this foundation of knowledge in order for students to get the most benefit out of them. Um, this kind of work has many practical barriers. There needs to be a concerted effort from people with many different kinds of expertise in order to address this need for more research. And educational games do have potential, as seen by the benefits here, even in this uh, very noisy sample, um, but more work is simply needed. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the various people no, who were no, involved no. in this project. <laughs> um, so like many of them in this room. <laughs> um, so there's Midi and particularly Walker for uh, a lot of instrumental support. Yeah, um, I think I gave you that entire team up there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, also, the asset program that I partnered with, which was both, both of researchers and former teachers, so they provide both content expertise and knowledge of what was age appropriate, how to fit things into classrooms, how to approach the teachers, that was very helpful. Um, including. Were they, were they still involved all the way up to the fall uh, test, or? Um, so they actually lost their grant funding partway through. Uh oh. So they're not officially a thing, but they're very interested in how the results turned out. I see. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, 